you so much for, for being here so early. It's a real pleasure for me to present uh, the main results of the Hunger Index of 2011. Uh, this year, which as Chenga mentioned, is linked to price spikes and especially to price uh, volatility. The idea of the index and, and, and why we have been working together to try to bring this index every year is to raise awareness of regional and country difference in hunger, to show progress uh, over time. Now, in this year's edition, we can compare across time. It's important to give us an idea of how the index is evolving over time. To learn from successes and failures, which countries are working well, which countries are improving, which are not, and how we can learn from them. And also to provide in incentives to act and improve in the national ranking because countries will see between each other how, is, how they are evolving uh, uh, over time. Now, what does the Global Hunger Index uh, measure? Uh, and it incorporates three dimensions. It incorporates undernourishment, which is a proportion of the population that is undernourished as a percentage. Child underweight, which is the prevalence of underweight in children under five. And child mortality, which is the proportion of children dying before the age of five. And we do a very simple index in which we combine these three dimensions, and with that we obtain uh, our global hunger index. Of course, you can use different weights to combine, and we have done several robustness checks, and the results remain basically the same, and that's why we decide to go through a simple measure that we can uh, use and easily explain uh, to people of this ranking done by the hunger index. The, the countries rank normally on a 100-point basis, although we won't have extreme values, uh, but that allows us to have the intensity of where the index is, which will go from low to moderate hunger, and normally we will put it as blue, to situations which are extremely alarming. And those are the ones where we need to really focus on which are the important policy recommendations, and also in the alarming ones, uh, to be able to avoid the uh, effects of uh, undernourishment and, of course, effects of over the years over the kids. One of the major issues and one of the major problems that we have to go through every year is the availability of data. Uh, this year, we were able to get data for the three different components uh, from 2005 to 2007 for the percentage of undernourishment, 2004 to 2009 for the underweight indicator, and 2009 for under five mortality. But as a challenge, and that's something that we need to push and put pressure to be able to improve this data and to be able to get more updated data on these three types of indicators. And I think we need to support initiatives similar to what Amis is trying to do in terms of food reserves and prices to be able to get all the data required to have an updated measure over time. Now, what is the performance of the of indicators, the regional performance of the indicators? And here we are plotting uh, the evolution over time of the global hunger index for the different regions uh, across the world. And as you see, in most of the case, in all the cases, there is a decrease. Although what is extremely alarming is the situation that we are facing still in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. The indicators are still extremely high, and as I will show later, the trends are no longer uh, reducing the index as before. They are starting to, to, to become more stable, which is something that we need to look, uh, to look at. Some other regions, like the case of Latin America, the index keeps improving, and we have countries which have significantly improved on the index, like the case of Nicaragua and the case of, of Peru. But in other regions, we are having countries which are really moving into alarming situations. This is the country performance by severity. The red, the more dark red the color, the, the highest the severity of the country. The, the, the greener the color, the lower the severity uh, of the country. Now, if we want to look to which have been the winners and which have been the losers uh, between 1990, Global Hunger Index, to 2011, this will be the, the ranking of countries. The ones which will, of course, focus most is in the losers, where we have Congo, uh, CR, DRC, Burundi, North Korea, Comoros, Swaziland, and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, but also we need to look at the winners to see what is working well, and here is what I was mentioning of countries like Nicaragua, which have improved significantly, the case of Peru, Fiji, Ghana, which is a country that the index has improved uh, significantly over time, Mexico, Malaysia, Turkey, and Kuwait. Now, when we try to observe what would be the relationship with, the, with, with respect to the cross-national income per capita, this is what we observe, uh, and the lines basically show the evolution of the index between 1990 to 2011. What is important to, to, to look at is how the trend of the index is changing. Like, for example, in, in Africa, we were observing a, a deep uh, decrease of the index, the green line at the top. But now it's slowing a little bit down, and similar things happen in most of the other regions. So relative to the GDP per capita, we are seeing a slowdown in the, in the, in the reduction 
of the of the index, which is something that we need to be concerned. And of course, this could mean and could be linked to what is happening in the last years since 2007, and even a little bit earlier on, on the food prices and how that could be affecting the different components of, of the index. Now, one of the, the key topics that we wanted to look this year was the link between high and volatile food prices. And when we mentioned high, especially we are looking to what we recall uh, as spikes. Now, why is this important? Because we know that high prices, of course, will hurt uh, urban households, but also rural households, mainly through consumption. But also, the major problem is that volatility will also hurt both, because in the case of the producers, they won't give them clear signals where to invest, and that, for sure, will have an effect over the production. And if they are also the net producers and consumers, they will have to affect their income and will affect their consumption. So that's something important and something that we wanted to bring up because we find differences, significant differences in terms of the volatility today relative to the historical uh, levels of volatility. So let me go briefly through, through, the, through some graphs to show the situation. This is historical evolution in real terms of the price of corn. But the only thing I want to bring in this message is that if you look at the 207, 208, and even if we look at the 2010, which is not clear there, it will be a little bit higher. The level of, of price spikes that we observe in 2007, 2008, and 2010, 11 are not historically high. There have been other periods where the prices have been high. Okay, so historically we are in the spikes, which of course damage consumers, but we are not historically in the highest levels. Now, in real terms, the problem we are facing today is that we have very low stock-to-use ratios, and, and the green line shows the evolution of the stock-to-use ratios uh, on the world, and the orange line shows excluding China because we have a lot of concerns about the quality of the data of reserves of China. And this is linked, if you look at this graph and you correlate this graph to, to the price evolution, it's linked the level of stock to use ratio should be around 30%, is right now around 20 or less percent, which is a problem. But the major issue that we want to bring is the, the concept of volatility. Now, this is a complex graph, and of course I'm not going to go in detail, but just for you to have an idea, this is the evolution of, of the excessive food price variability for hard wheat. This graph goes from 2000 to today, and we can go backwards to 1954. Now, the, the red lines that you observe there are periods that we have identified through a model, a kind of sophisticated model, which we call excessive price volatility periods. As you can see here, in the later periods, you have a lot more red shades, which means that we have more periods of excessive volatility. The green line is the returns, and the orange line is our model, which captures extreme value. So whenever we cross that extreme value, we are in extreme value of volatility, and that's what helps us to define those red shades. Now, in average, between 2001 and 2006, we have per year 33 days of excessive price volatility. Between 2007 and today, we have 85 days of excessive price volatility. That number is extremely high and is historically high in difference to the price level. So clearly today we are facing extreme price volatility relative to what we have historically in the past. Now, there are many issues behind this and many reasons why this is happening. And this graph tries to summarize the different drivers behind it. And we have the future prices, which is affecting the spot prices, international prices, the biofuel policies, which are also put into pressure, linking oil with agriculture, and linking the competition for land and water, environmental and climate change issues, which of course is linked to water management, and secondary round effects like the trade reforms, which also exacerbate the effects over the evolution of local prices. And of for sure, you also have domestic policies, which will affect uh, price quality. Now, let me take some pictures of, of the key things that we think are there. The first thing is that we have a, a very concentrated portfolio of commodities, of, of exporting countries, exporting commodities, key staples. Just for example, in the case of maize and wheat, the top five exporters concentrate 84% in the case of wheat of exports. That means the US basically 53% of those. In the case of wheat, 63%. What this means, that if anything happens in any of these five countries, automatically that will be reflected in an increase in price. And we have seen that. Not remember, in the case of Russia, Russia was 11% in that time of the share of exports in wheat. Russia decides to put an experiment, automatically the price goes up. So our world portfolio is extremely concentrated, and that is really related to climate change. If there is an effect of variability in climate, which could affect any of these countries, that would be affected. In the case of rice, the situation is even tougher, especially in the case of milled rice, where it's 85%. So again, if anything happens in Thailand, then the policies that are trying to be implemented to support producers automatically could have an effect in prices. And we saw that clearly in the 208 spike of, of, of rice. 
The second component, and one of the drivers, is the issue of biofuels. And this is just a graph to show how much the share of corn of the U.S. is being used for biofuel production. And you can see that it has gone up to 35% of the production of corn is moving into biofuels. Now, demand for biofuel is good because you are demanding more products. The problem is the policies implemented to support that demand, which are basically subsidies and mandates. And the concern is that the mandate, for example, which assures me as a producer of biofuel, a, a, a solid demand, allows me to go in and out in huge velocity to the market. And that in and out creates an influence over volatility. So basically, I am transferring the volatility from oil directly to the volatility to food production because of the linkage and because of the assure of the mandates. So those are the policies that we need to look carefully and which are clearly uh, affecting uh, volatility of prices. And then the last driver, or the previous to the last, is the, is the issue of the climate change. And this is basically showing some simulations of different scenarios of economic growth where the, the pessimistic scenario is where we assume high population growth and low economic growth, and the optimistic scenario is when we have good economic growth and low population growth. And in all the cases, if we bring the climate change scenario, we will observe a significant increase in, in prices. The last driver uh, is the link towards financial markets. And what we have seen is that there has been a significant increase in the activities in the financial markets. The problem with this is that only 2% of those transactions get realized. So just for example, in the case of corn, three times more than what is produced is being traded in the, in the, in the future commodity. Now, this doesn't mean that liquidity is bad because this brings liquidity to the market. But what it means is that I am creating an overheating of the market. And we need to look carefully into how much liquidity we need to have in this market and how much excessive liquidity could put significant pressures over prices. And finally, the export bans, which are policies derived by the countries, which also create an effect, because it's not only the natural shock, but also the influence of the different export bans, which will create an increase in prices. So let me now go to the key recommendations. The first group of recommendations are policies to address the drivers of price spikes and food price volatility. The first one is to revise biofuel policies, especially mandates and, and to eliminate subsidies or reduce them. Regulate financial activities in food markets to which we need to look carefully into the derivative markets and what policies of transparency, of transparency of information should be put in place. Adapt to and mitigate extreme weather and climate change. And invest in agricultural research and development to improve our portfolio of exporting countries. The second set of policies are protecting global market characteristics, affecting volatility and price spikes. And here we talk about balanced global export market structures through the promotion of poor agricultural growth. Build up food and global and regional emergency reserves, similar to what Prepare is trying to do in the case of, of the World Food Program and the pilot which is supposed to happen in, in West Africa. Collect and share information on food markets, and this is being pushed through AMIS, the Agricultural Market Information System. And finally, the policy to help households to cope, which is establish national social protection systems, which are extremely important, and this is especially important for the case of Sub-Saharan Africa. Improve emergency preparedness, invest in smallholder farmers and sustainable and climate change adaptive agriculture. Foster and support non-farm income opportunities in rural areas and improve livelihood options for the poor in urban areas. And finally, strengthen basic service provisions at all levels. Thank you so much.